doing? Being recorded. What happens if, oh, you can either leave the meeting or be recorded. Okay. Somebody's lawyer got involved. Um, so we're gonna be um, doing a couple of exercises that a fabulous abstract artist named Jane Davies does. Um, these are kind of from her tool book. Uh, she's a great teacher. She actually um, used to come to Portland uh, once a year with the big art festival that they have, Art and Soul. And she uh, teaches kind of everywhere. And she's really known for her YouTube videos. Like she puts a lot of YouTube videos out. Um, we're gonna watch an introduction to her. It doesn't actually talk about the exercises that we're gonna do today. I'm gonna lead those for you, but you know, it's always good. This particular video is about the work that she's created during the pandemic, which I think it's an interesting, you know, this is where we are now, where we get to see what artists bring out of their stores that have, they've been working on for the last year. And um, it's kind of an exciting time in that way. Um, it's a little more, this work is a little more basic than uh, than some of her older works, but I think this video is lovely and it's, it's a good introduction to her. So I'm gonna play it for us all. Throughout my painting career, I've kind of explored different kinds of visual expression. Abstract language is really compelling to me, the colors, the shapes, and the pandemic somehow found me with with these stripes. There was something in me that just wanted to work on something easy, right? And of course, that's not really possible <laughs> uh, if it's gonna be a compelling image. I'm just using this really simple format to look at color relationships, value relationships, the colors, the shapes, the lines. With this piece, I didn't have any particular thing in mind that I can remember, but I just liked it. It said happiness to me. So I called it Sunshine Stripes. And then I ended up using it sort of like a study to make larger pieces. And some of it's like shading at the edges, and some of it is just kind of using a little bit of a variety of colors to make one stripe. That happens through kind of layering. Color is such a such a strong evocative language, really just on its own. But I'm just really interested to see, for example, how little bright color it takes to make the whole piece look bright. Another thing that sort of interests me is like seeing layers of sedimentary rock and seeing how that's exposed and try to get some stripes and layers that are really gonna bring that to mind for me. But I was also looking at the quilts of G's Bend. They're quilts made by women from G's Bend, Alabama, which is a fairly isolated community. The quilts are largely made out of worn out clothing. And those are the ones that, that just speak to me. Here at the edges, I've added a little bit of this transparent quinacridone gold, which is a beautiful rust color. And then I just wipe it away. What I'm trying to bring out here is kind of a sense of, of aging, maybe a little bit of depth as if it's like the seam in a quilt. Each individual piece works vertically and horizontally. And so I love the idea that someone who wants the work in their home could put together two or more pieces in their own configuration. So I've recently been working on these uh, collage pieces that I'm thinking of as shape studies and then paying a lot of attention to the negative space. And that's the space, the white space. This sensibility has, has found its way into my stripes, doing these dramatic contrasts, dark to light against very subtle, almost imperceptible contrast, right? Gray, off-white next to off-white. One real benefit of this new studio is that it allows me to work larger. Um, so case in point over here, I wanna fill large spaces. And I think this exploration using stripes and these shapes 
uh, really lend themselves to to a larger scale. So I'm excited about that. To reach an audience or a clientele of people that want to own my work, I, mean, I count on the gallery a great deal, but I support that by sharing everything that I'm doing on, on social media and on my website. Making more paintings and painting more is making my paintings better. Okay. So, you know. The truth is that Hollywood's elite actors can get ripped while adding. Oh, sorry. It would just kept rolling. The video kept going like nobody's business. We don't need that. Okay. So Jane Davies has been doing abstract abstract art for a really long time. Um, she is a, a living great, you know, and her work is incredibly beautiful. It's interesting to see these stripes because, you know, before the stripes, her works used shape and color to really explore some things. We're going to do two exercises that Jane teaches and that I actually use on a regular basis in my studio. So for the first exercise, I've cut my pages into smaller, um, kind of easier to cycle through multiple at once, right? I have three here and then I have like a stack of probably four more over here. Um, I have out my plastic palette knife. I have a lot to say about palette knives personally. I don't like to use metal palette knives because I like the bend that plastic has. I have my weird squeegee um, that I showed you guys from the dollar store, my dollar store, Betty Crocker. Uh, oh, I guess I don't have my, oh, and then I got my, the normal one that I use that you guys see me use all the time, my scraper. However, if you do not have these tools because they, you don't, they don't exist for you, you can also use, I took this edge of my cardboard from a package that I recently got uh, and it works just fine because we're not, we're not working totally huge today. Today, we're gonna be doing compositions in smaller sizes. So this is, Jane calls this her, I think it's called like a squeegee and palette knife quick composition. Um, for myself, I think it's always a good exercise when you're um, trying to warm up a little bit, it's a great warm up. Um, it also helps you really um, figure out maybe what you want to do on larger compositions. I have my own color palette, so I have the Quinox. I'm using all primarily uh, fluid acrylics today. I'm going to use some Quinacridone um, nickel gold, which she was talking about because it's the best color in the world. I'm going to use Quinacridone magenta. I got a turquoise and a, like a chromium oxide. Nothing too um, extensive. I got a couple of other ones. So when I do this exercise, I like my first couple of layers to be more translucent, more transparent. So um, I would say you could use watercolor, except for watercolor is really hard to layer on top of itself because of its ability to kind of re-pigmentize once it gets wet. Um, so I use fluid acrylics, and then I use a heavy body fluid acrylic towards the end of the layers. The, the notion here is that you are creating layers and working on a composition. It's a really fairly simple exercise, but the thing about it is, you know, it, it can teach you a lot. Um, some people like to do it really small. I will even sometimes flip my paper. So I'm not going to do anything with these, except for sometimes they stand for collage water, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. So your first layer is going to want to be a bigger swoop or a bigger statement. I'm going to go with this turquoise because everybody loves turquoise. You know, and then you're starting to fill, fill the page. So, you know, we're going to build up layers of translucent paints and see what they can do. Um, so we're going to work on multiple kind of surfaces at once. Here's where, you know, a really limited color palette is helpful. 
because you don't have a ton of space, you know? You're not, you're not developing this giant canvas. And, and what we're working on is how are, will our colors react together? Um, you know, and we're getting used to our tools. So what you're gonna wanna do is create your first couple of layers and you're gonna let them dry. I am using also, my, my paper today is a bristle board. Um, I think that for smaller studies, it's really, it helps the paint dry well. I don't like it for large paintings. If I'm doing more than just a couple of quick layers, I'm not really interested in it. Um, but for this exercise, it's pretty good. I'm trying to keep my What's Up app open. So if you guys have questions, I can actually answer them. And then, you know, this is the first layer. We have a couple of different compositions started. They're fairly quick and easy. The intention here is not to overthink this, but to kind of just explore. Um, and then we'll go into second layers here. And we're going to start to layer them together. Hey, Chris. I, yeah. Yeah. Hey, are we um, are we trying to replicate her stripes per se? No, her stripes are just actually the work that she's working on right now. And this exercise doesn't lend well to the stripes. If you're interested in stripes, that's definitely a compositional tool you can use. That was just an introduction kind of into who she is and what she's doing as an artist. Okay. We're not really replicating anything right now. The intention here is, is that you're exploring a little bit, but you're just, you, you're not using a paintbrush. We're working in thin, super thin translucent layers so that we can really figure out what paint goes well over top of each other. This is kind of when I talk about developing your own kind of visual um, experience here. This, these quick kind of studies are, are how you can kind of do that. Um, so then, so does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Awesome, thanks for asking. This is the kind of exercise I do at night when I'm sitting watching Letterkenny <laughs> or uh, Virgin Rivers, what I've been watching this week. Um, you know, it's just, I guess it's natural flow, consciousness kind of like letting go a little bit. Okay, let's talk though about the like, we're going to let these layers dry and then we're going to start to layer them as you can see especially with this one i tried to bring the camera really close today so that we could so that when i point to things you guys can see we're starting with this one right here we're starting to see how the different paints actually layer over top of each other and and we can start to form ideas or feelings about how we think about that um don't be afraid to leave negative space to not have to fill your page entirely but try to and this is the hardest part try to complete a full story you know um it can take a few few levels or a few layers for you to, for you to do that but don't be afraid to you know stop if you feel like i don't really know where this is going let it dry think about it a little bit um they don't all have to be the same color schemes either. You can work on multiple color schemes at once. I just happen to kind of keep it minimal and, and study them all. Okay, it's kind of a quick process. You know, you want to experiment with all kinds of sizes too. Another thing to not forget to try out is like make, make your, your paint mark or your scratch mark or whatever it is go off the page, you know? So as we, um, as I personally work on these kinds of things, often I will, you know, get to a, a point where I'm like, oh, the color looks good. I like what it's doing. Um, I want to finish it a little bit though, or I want to, I want to make it seem like it's a complete composition, right? Um, and one of the ways that you can do that is you can either use a small pen like this a small pencil to create marks, or you can cut up paper that you have painted into different shapes. Um, Jane does that a lot. She uses a lot of collage and our, actually our next, uh, what we're gonna focus on is next is gonna be collage. Um, that's the next thing, but it's collage of things we make, which is interesting. So 
you guys want to get out some small pieces of paper, get out your paints and start, you know, I encourage you to try to use tools that you don't typically use. This is a great opportunity for you to try new things. Um, don't be afraid if you don't have something that's straight edge like I do, use the cardboard, it works really well. And, you know, again, I would like to encourage you, especially on these like low cost, low stress compositions here, push yourself a little farther than you want to. Um, see what might happen if you do that. Amazing things can happen and terrible things can happen. We just never know. So. But the beautiful thing is, if a terrible thing happens, it's not like you're a surgeon. <laughs> right, well, and that's, and that's the thing. You're not doing it on a $50 canvas that you spent a lot of money on. You're doing it on a piece of paper, you know? And sometimes, when it dries, you're like, oh man, how will I ever replicate that again? <laughs> <laughs> that was so awesome. And I, now I'll never be able to make it do that again. I will sometimes make notes on the actual composition if it's something I really like. Does anybody have any questions or does this feel overwhelming for some folks or does it feel like this is perfect amount of information? It's the perfect amount of information. <laughs> Excellent. I assume since nobody said anything that it was the perfect amount of information. I do want to say one more thing that I forgot to say. As your thin translucent layers are drying, consider maybe how a thicker, more opaque paint might be on top. Yeah, I wipe it on my, and I have always wiped it on my aprons. You know, it's just like, if I don't like things on my hands, so I tend to not like it on my tools. Uh, it's a silly thing that I do. And that's funny. It does make very beautiful aprons. And recently I had a drop cloth that I've used for the last 10 years turned into a beach bag by a local bag maker. And that has been pretty incredible to, to be able to use every day to, you know, be able to show people that like, leftover part of your painting process that often ends up being so much more beautiful than the rest of it. Something I really appreciated about Jane's um, video that she just shared was, you know, Leah and I work for an organization that, that has been established in Portland for a really long time. And so during the pandemic, we didn't wanna not have our main event. We were working with our artists to have a virtual event. And we got a pretty good glimpse of a lot of artists response to the pandemic. And I kind of make this joke that it kind of goes into either one of two categories, either artists shut their brains off and just tried to survive or they like went into hyper production mode. And we had a bunch of those artists who kind of shut their brain off, kind of reawaken during the event and suddenly kind of had this panic. I appreciated that Jane said, I just wanted to do something easy. Um, and I, I can associate with that. I did for the, the days that Oregon was in hard lockdown, 58 days, I did a small composition every day. And I would just work on it at the end of the night and then I would title it about my day. So I had this kind of weird documentation of this thing that we've been going through, you know, we're still going through.
And if you see your, find yourself finishing up, go ahead and start some more compositions. We're gonna work like this for a little while just because um, the next exercise that we're gonna use, you will have the opportunity to reuse some of these if you don't like them um, and to develop them differently. So go ahead and make quite a few for yourself if you have the space on your desk or whatnot. Okay, now you guys should be getting far enough that you're like, ah. And the question now comes into play, like when we're working on something like this, what makes a good small composition? What are these successful versus not successful? And the reality is with abstract art that's entirely subjective. Everybody has some rules about balance. The kind of the main thought is, is that if they're balanced, if they, you know, balance between value, which is like kind of shade versus color, there's a lot of harmony. I always make the argument if it has a little bit of surprise. <laughs> um, but I think it's entirely subjective. You just know your gut tells you.
Okay, so I'm going to let these all dry and I'm going to decide what I'm going to do with them all if I like them or I want to keep them or not. Um, this one in particular I'm liking. I definitely put a little more space with it and I brought in a, a brush, but so far it's really nice and I'm going to let it dry for a little bit before I do anything about it. So there are there is a second way that um, Jane Davies really teaches about how to make like work on your compositional skills essentially and it's kind of a fun little process um and it's collage which is you know a basic component of abstract art but um something that she teaches and that i'm a big fan of is saving your old compositions for collage material so i have a mini flat file, meaning that it's kind of short, full of my old comp old uh, pieces that I turn into new pieces by creating collages. So I'm going to pull off this little stack that I, I pulled out earlier. 
And when I cut down my pieces or I um, get rid of them or, or do something different with them, I always keep all the little weird scraps. This one I kept specifically because I like the way that these dots look. And I know from my experience doing lots of collages like this, also the back is really lovely, that small marks on little shreds of paper are really useful in this kind of collage process. So, you know, I rip up a lot of my pieces. Hold on. I'm, I have pieces that like, for whatever reason, didn't work. And if I'm like, oh, but I really like the way, and I do, I really like the way that this went over top of this other color, then I can just keep this one part of it that I really like, and I can create a new composition with it. So I, I will often go through my little weird little pile of, of collage papers. It's like strips even, just all kinds of weird like things that I've done and that I liked for a lot of different reasons. And I will start a new composition. So I'll pick out some pages, some pieces where I feel like the colors speak to each other interestingly. Um, and I will kind of start something entirely new. So um, there's a couple of ways to kind of successfully do this. Um, I like to start on a plain white piece of paper like this. I like to have some marks. So I have like a little tiny frame, right? And I mark the, the corners generally just for size so that I know eh, I don't really want my composition to go out much more than that. So I want to keep it in the middle. Oh, let's not put on my wet paint because that's what I'm doing immediately. And then, you know, start using some of the pieces that I already have to create new stuff. Um, I like to rip it. You don't have to rip it. You can actually, you know, be really delicate about your pieces and actually cut them. Um, I think that it just depends on how you want the actual um, collage to, to look in the end. I use Uhu or Uh Oh Static Magic Glue, glue Stick, it's pretty basic. I like to figure out my whole composition before I glue it down, though. And, you know, it gives me an opportunity to try out new things together that, you know, I previously didn't do and see if they can be more successful. Um, it's a really fun process. And I will often like cut them into little shapes and add, you know, something a little different than I had before. Um, I don't, it's not a, a waste knot kind of thing. It's like, what kind of challenge, how can I make this work that I previously did have new light? Um, so one of the things so about this is that you need to have enough work to have enough paper to collage, right? And not everybody's been painting like this for 10 years and has like literally hundreds of pieces of paper. So one of the things that you can do is you can actually, with kind of these small compositions, make yourself collage paper, but be kind of smart about it. Um, what, and what I mean by that is, Give yourself enough interest in the papers that you have that you can be successful when you are collaging. Um, I don't. What did I do? What did I do? That I had left myself some short pages. Um, because you're going to want to make some new stuff. And what I mean by that is this is a great example. You know, I just went through and created kind of different textures that I like so they could use it in the future um, for collage material. Like this one is a great corner square, right? It's really beautiful. It's got some marks from my pencil and just two stripes. It's a pretty basic little square, but it works really nicely if I'm expanding on something else um, that I'm working on. So kind of what you're gonna be doing today is not only thinking about your collages and working on your collages, but you're gonna to wanna to make collage paper for yourself. Another pretty simple couple of things that you can do to help yourself out. Oh, sorry, everybody. I knew it was gonna to happen today. 
Hold on, sorry. Sorry, friends. I should have got my brushes ahead of time and I didn't. Um, is, you know, use colors. Oh, Jesus, Pete. Use colors that you like and make simple things like stripes or dots or little half marks um, so that you have some extra pages when you're working with your, your collage material. I'm gonna do it on this because I can't seem to find the pages that I saved for myself. It's pretty common in my life, you know, so that you can bring them in with your other collage material. I'm gonna send you guys some photos of collages that I've actually framed because they're really, sorry. Clearly my um, little tripod's really struggling today. Um, so give yourself some basics is what I'm trying to say. Don't be afraid to, to make pages that you can specifically um, use for this. Another thing is, is that you can um, make collage material out of other types of paper that you have. Uh, if you have pieces of a phone book, I mean, we don't really have phone books anymore, but I used to have pieces of a phone book. I have pages out of dictionary books that I've pulled out and just washed with one color and let dry. And then I can use that in my actual collages as like good background washes and things like that. Tissue paper, it's a great opportunity because it easily glues down and it's kind of a really neutral um, collage choice. So I'm gonna work on making some uh, collage papers as well as making some collages. Um, I have found the pages I was looking for and I have made myself two guides and I would suggest this to you guys as you're working in compositions and you're wanting to get better and you're wanting to make work that you like more, which, you know, there is a point you're gonna to wanna to do that. So a big thing that you can do is you can cut down a larger composition into smaller compositions and you'll find that it's more successful. So you can create yourself literally two L's, right? That when they overlap, oh, not the purple side though. When they overlap, they create a frame that changes right and you can decide if you want to keep compositions that way how i might use that is on one of these things say i didn't really like the way that it looked and say i'm looking and i'm working on my collage i can change the size of my little guides smaller and smaller to different shapes you know jane was working on those stripes right so her stripes actually started as collage paper and she actually started before she was painting the stripes, they were collaged stripes. So if you wanna look at your work and make little tiny stripes, you can using this kind of modified viewfinder. I work in a couple of basic sizes. And so I actually have mats that are created in those basic sizes that I like, to, you know, easy to frame, that I like to work. And then I can look at something and say, you know, is this different if I move it over here and I add more negative space? Is it different if I fill it with more color? How far can I get it? You know, and like, this is kind of a nice, a nice composition here. I didn't really originally like the um, painting itself, but I feel like with a little bit of gold leaf, and maybe a, a couple of little um, watercolor scratches on this green side, I might really like it. Um, and this, you know, helped me decide what that looks like. This just gives you more of an opportunity to go as big or as small as you want, right? You could start really big, you know, with the, just the edges, and then you could create a map if you wanted to stay that big, right? I do this with a lot of my paintings. I just did a, or I did in January, a 32 foot installation. And I installed in a trailer up here and I did these big, long 16 foot paintings. Well, so then when the installation came down, I still wanted to use the paintings. They still had a lot of good, beautiful parts that were just super, I was gravitated towards. And I actually used frames and cut them down 
into smaller pieces. And so then it's got kind of this collection. This one giant painting became a bunch of little paintings. So it works both ways, right? I'm going to keep some of these things that I know I'm going to rip up because they're super cool and add to. And I'm going to use my viewfinders to determine where my composition is the strongest. I really want to encourage the viewfinder thing because I think sometimes we get so lost in what we're working on, we mess something up and we think the whole thing is gone. Like this just doesn't look good. It also helps you when figuring out like what is what do I think a strong composition is. I have some feelings about what strong compositions are. Some artists have other feelings. They like to fill the whole page with as many colors as they possibly can. And to them, that's when it's super strong. So these viewfinders help you determine that taste for yourself and start to see that eye. Um, I'm gonna continue on screen to be working through this collage process. If you guys have any um, questions, please feel free to um, ask them, get a hold of me any way you would like. Please share on the WhatsApp app. I'm on there, I've shared a couple of my mine. Oh gosh, you guys are doing so good. I love that you guys are fearless. Um, I think it's really important with abstract painting to be fearless. I also appreciate that you guys kept to minimum um, colors so that you don't overdo it. I think that it's a little easier to start that way in the beginning. Um, so good job, everyone. Oh, that's so good with the blue and the yellow. Oh, and the rest, it's so good. Yes. Les, I really like your purple in there, which is really strange for me. It's really surprising to me, considering that I generally just like purple. Another thing that I kind of do for these raw marks is that I have this really old, gross, terrible house painting brush. I don't even know how I got it. That has just been destroyed. But it makes some of the best marks because the brush, um, the brush hairs have clumped together and kind of created something a little different. Oh, yep. Good job using the little thing. Is that fingers or dots? Cut me more bubble wrap. People are smart. Bubble, bubble wrap again. Yep, the bubble wrap is always such a solid, good choice. I freaking love it. Yeah, me too. I'm into it. It's like a shape for our time. <laughs> Like every, you kind of, it feels very familiar, right? Everybody's getting stuff on Amazon. Bubble wrap is fucking everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I had this conversation with uh, one of the things that I do twice a week. I work for two hours in a food cart. Uh, a friend of mine has a food cart that's in my parking lot. And, you know, I told him that I'd help him out because as everybody knows there is a uh, like a staffing shortage for a variety of reasons. And um, I, I helped him out and I told him I'd do it as long as it was fun, but we're, it, we're in the food cart today. We just got murdered and sold out in two hours. And he's talking to me about drunk Amazoning or yeah, drunk Amazoning. I'm like, what? And he's like, well, he's, he, these socks, they're so cute. And I said, they are so cute. He goes, I think I drunk Amazon them. I bought them on Amazon one night when I was drunk. And I was like, I don't know about other people, but I don't get drunk to make up on stuff. But I guess this is really a thing I just didn't know anything about. Okay. Drunk Amazon. Okay. Drunk Amazon. <laughs> it's funny to me. Oh, 
Oh, I was going to take a picture of those frame pieces. Give me a second. I'll be right back. Makes me hungry, Krista. <laughs> I don't know why. Sorry, I went all the way into the, the gallery to get them because they're hanging on the wall. In there. What are you working on, Leah? I'll show you. I'm uh, I'm taking some time to work on furniture. <laughs> oh, I like that one. Isn't she pretty? She's great, like going off the tattoo, right? Yeah. This is uh, my boyfriend's oldest friend, but they've known each, meaning they've known each other the longest amount of time and they have chat. She's the manager at the Blue Moon. That's awesome. Yeah, it's she's a freaking like baller. <laughs> I think she's like gorgeous. I've been wanting to paint. She's a, like a Ruben model. Uh, what do you call it? A, like a Ruben's model. She's just very beautiful. So. I've been fighting, trying to get her features in the right places, but I think I finally got it. I feel the same way when I do abstract paintings and I talk about this process of using the viewfinder. I feel like you're fighting to get the compositional sections in the right, right space, you know, you're moving it around and really trying to figure out what is exactly the perfect place. And maybe we're looking for something based off of of human features, right? We do that. I I think that I think you're absolutely right on that. That's why I love all these classes and how you teach them because you make those connections that are happening in our brains, right? 
Yeah. All of the, the things that are inspiring us in life and how we. Oh my gosh, you guys want to hear a really cute little story. So this weekend was Art Walk, uh, which was a really busy time for our art gallery. And I had a bunch of new work up and we're getting ready for Astoria Open Studios, which is next weekend and not this weekend, coming to one after. And Monday, a, for some reason, we had a crazy run of people on Monday come through the gallery. But this little kid comes through and because I use such bright pinks, I can't photograph my work. I can, it doesn't photograph well. Sometimes it just doesn't even photograph the pink in the actual work. It takes a lot of digital manipulation and I hate it. So I do these sketches like we're doing right now, you know, these weird little um, tiny little collages and, and sketches that I've cut down and I have a simple matting process and I sell them in my gallery as sketch. And this little kid comes and he must have been, I don't know, nine years old. And he is like looking through the, the sketches and he's trying to find like the one he really likes. And he's like putting some of the sketches to the side. And he finally finds the one that he likes. And he's like, this mom, this is the one. So, you know, I go up to ring them up and he's kind of like peeking into the studio because we have a, a door that separates our gallery from our studio. And I'm like, would you like to come into the studio? the look on the kid's face to come into a real art studio and to like look around and like see things that he kind of understood. Like my partner has her ceramic studio on that side, you know, and she's got kilns and stuff. And he's like, I know what that does. And like points at a kiln and he's like, that, that bakes, that dry, dries the clay real quick is what he said. Uh, the most heartwarming experience, that kid knew the composition he liked he took one I wouldn't have thought was ever going to sell. And he just was so connected to it. It's, he is so far from the point of society telling him what's beautiful and good. And he's still just in that place of my heart likes that. That's the one, you know, I love that. We are, I actually sold a painting to a woman who came in for art walk with her friend, looked at my, looked at a painting. She had been there 10 seconds, I swear. But I'm buying that painting right there. She looks at the rest of the painting, she comes back around to that painting, says, I need that painting right there. It amazes me when people- I've done that. <laughs> yeah, your heart just goes, yep, that's the one. Know it, that's in it. yeah. And it's really, really delightful. And then she told me she was gonna put it in her suitcase and I was like, no, you're not, I'm gonna ship it to you. <laughs> is a really it looks care this is a great example of how bad they can look before you frame them a little bit Carissa how old do you think he was like nine perfect yeah he was super adorable right and just um it's those moments that you really realize how much art impacts people. I just think to myself, like as a kid his age, I wouldn't have gone on vacation somewhere with my family and had my had my souvenir be a sketch from a gallery, right? Like mine would have been like a t-shirt or something like like that. That kid, no, nope, he knew. He knew that he wanted that sketch. We actually have in our art gallery, we have a youth art like a featured youth artist. Oh, Leah, you're gonna love this. We have a featured youth artist every month and kids, we allow kids to drop off their artwork and then we show it in our gallery in like a little frame spot, you know, and their name goes up there and like, <laughs> so we get a package one day from Audrey's mom from Michigan. I'm like, what is this? And I open it and Audrey's mom is submitting a drawing for our kid art show that Audrey did when she was three years old. Okay. Yes. And so, you know, I, I try really hard with the kid art to take them in order that they, they come in. So this month is Audrey's drawing. 
She's finally oh, great. Do you have a picture of Audrey when she was three too? Mm -hmm. That will be awesome. It's a it's a drawing of her mom from when Audrey was three. Oh, it's gonna love that. That is what's up right now. You know when she. Oh my god, that's so great. Let me see if I have a picture of it. Otherwise, I can go get one. Yes. Um, I may have told this story once before, but I this is nothing to do with art. But I did hear a hilarious story about squirrels today, the other day. Oh, tell me. I got a call from um, the people who run Copy Pilot. You know, Shane. Okay. Uh, He's the most interesting guy in the whole world. Totally, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so these, so, so you guys, Copy Pilot is a little like mailbox place that's like four blocks from where I live, and the they, most alternative, crazy guy you've ever met. In the whole world. Yes, and uh, so he and his girlfriend, his partner, work there, and uh, and about a year ago, they came in. She came in and she had these scratches on her arm. And I was like, what is this? And she kind of looked around quietly and said, Shane and I adopted, adopted a squirrel, right? So they found a baby squirrel whose leg had been broken and they they adopted it. Like they, well, you know, they just started out like trying to heal the squirrel, um, which of course is completely, but you know, it's been a year and that squirrel just lives with them now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so anyways, but then imprinted on them, it, they probably won't be able to let it go. No, absolutely not. And they don't well, want baby squirrels do. Yeah, right. And you know, of course, this is completely illegal, right? Like actually, if Fish and Wildlife found out about it, they'd make you get rid of the squirrel. Oh, and, well, yeah, uh, right. So so anyway, Tammy, so parent, so Tammy calls me the other day and she's like, Leah, I want to talk to you about something. So when I come into the office, She's like, would you like to adopt a baby squirrel? Because somebody else who, not their squirrel, but there's somebody else who has a baby squirrel and they're moving. And I'm like, and then Shane looks at her and says, oh, no. And I said, I can't do that. I live in a basement. I've got two cats that don't really like each other. I can't imagine throwing a squirrel into that equation. And, uh, and she said, that's all right. And Shane said, oh, that's right, honey. There's two more squirrel families that live just down the street. I'm like, squirrel families? She said, there's an entire underground network of people who have adopted baby squirrels. There is a vet in Corvallis that will meet you to fix your squirrel, but only at midnight. <laughs> you have to drive your squirrel in. But a two Black and a market half. squirrel, man. <laughs> it's a whole thing. There's that a city. That city. Like <laughs> all these people, there are two squirrel families on my block apparently <laughs> so <laughs> the, the guy who used to sell us christmas trees of course he's from vermont and is that you know sells christmas trees for a living so he's totally earthy earthy dude and he rescued a flying squirrel and you know they jump and they've got the really kind of bat wingy things between them. Like this, right? yeah, yeah and then they kind of coast for a while before they hit another tree right and um and it would fly around their house, like from the top of the bookcase to the couch. <laughs> it was amazing. Oh man, people are so funny. <laughs> it's, it's like so funny. <laughs> and I mean, I love that there are so many people who are doing this thing they're not supposed to be doing. I love that there's like, like there's a whole network set up for them. There are top secret ways to get your squirrel worked on. Yeah, right? Like you can call. But what are you going to do if you if you get a baby squirrel with a broken leg? You're going to just let it die? I guess that's what. And particularly here in this part of the world, there's one type of squirrel they that no one will rescue. It's a, considered an invasive species. It's a red squirrel. Uh, so if it's a red squirrel, they won't even come. Right? Can we talk about the fact that people know the difference? I wouldn't know what a red squirrel was. Okay. Well, don't worry. There's a lot of people out there taking care of squirrels. <laughs> and yeah, Tammy and Shane won't let their squirrel outdoors anymore because they feel like now it's so used to people, it'll like drop on somebody's shoulder. <laughs> and people will be like, what the fuck? You know, like get off of this.
squirrel will it, it just could be it could hurt the squirrel <laughs> I guess, you know we live next door to a, a property and because you haven't seen the house yet leah we live next to this property that's like dilapidated and just got repurchased and the people are going to try to turn it into a live workspace right and it has a raccoon underneath the house <laughs> and the baby raccoon Gosh. you can see from our yard and audrey likes to go over there with her crackers or cookies or whatever and <laughs> Feed, try to feed the baby squirrel or feed the baby raccoon because her grandmother trained all of the wildlife around her property to come in shifts on her front porch to get fed so as a young child audrey has a picture of her holding a baby raccoon like <laughs> you know, like yeah, just like snow white and this is gonna say her grandmother was snow white she was oh, fairy tale um and I said, Audrey, Audrey, don't. We can't get the animals around here to think that we're going to take care of them because they'll come out when my dog is there and she's purebred by him and she will eat them. They'll be gone. Yeah. It's always yeah. tricky to know how that interaction goes. I've got a crow that comes to my house every day. And it actually now clears its throat. <laughs> it doesn't even it's on the branch it does it i have i have a little hot tub in the back and i take a hot tub in the morning very early at like 6 30. so when it sees me in there it'll fly to the nearest tree stand there look over its shoulder and go <coughs> <coughs> until i get it some cat food it likes dry cat food <laughs> oh good that's hysterical <coughs> 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 We have adopted an older guy. We've adopted this guy, he comes by our studio every day at 10 o'clock to give our dogs treats. He was known as the crow man. He would give peanuts to all of the crows and so they would follow him around town. We couldn't figure out why for a little while the dogs always knew when he was real close. I was like, why do they always know? Oh, no. we they could see the birds. They could see the crows flying above him. They knew that the crows flying like that meant that he was near. Yeah. 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 Those are smart. They have generational knowledge. Do you know that? Isn't that crazy? It's insane. It's insane. I'm working on stripes just like Jane Davies right now. I'm actually just, I've been doing a lot of stripes lately. And, uh, Maybe maybe she works with others right. It's just easy, right? Carissa, I like it very much. Thank you. Oh, it's yeah. a fun one. Ooh. Isn't that nice? Marcel. I love that. Look how nice that looks. I love that you use ripped paper too. I really have, I have a thing for the edges of ripped paper and the way that they create transitions. Um, I love the little red marks at the bottom too. It's like the perfect little detail. I think I pulled the frame in a little bit on the on the right hand side. Yeah, you know, that's the the harder part with the two L pieces, right? Because they move so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I love it. I'm telling you, this is an addiction. I'm sorry that I introduced you all to this addiction. <laughs> um, but what I can attest to from my own personal career is, is that my the strength of my compositions got a lot better from this process. You know, you save all the work that you're making, it's not working, and then you kind of make something new and exciting out of it. The ultimate recycling. really 
uh, fun watching you guys work. <laughs> That's sweet. I feel I don't really really sit down that much and take that kind of time usually. <laughs> That's yeah. the time I really get to do that. <laughs> Oh, there is no class next week, guys, because Chris's birthday is on the 20th on next Tuesday. So, my 20th birthday, so we're I'm not coming. It's a big one. It's a big one. I'm an old lady. Just oh. kidding. I don't feel that way, just so everybody knows. Ooh, Leslie, I like that. God, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Delicious. Oh, I love it. I love the way that the side, you know, the diagonal lines come into play. And those little yellow dots. Or spots on dots. I like, Leslie, that you use a lot of geometric features in your work. It's something I really appreciate. And if anybody ever tells, so you guys know now to say, like if anybody tells you, oh, abstract art, that's easy. You can be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. It's complicated. You need knowledge. You need practice. You need to know rules. You need to follow rules in abstract painting. People don't fucking like following rules. <laughs> I noticed that. They don't like it. It's totally an interesting different process for sure. Yeah. It has made me appreciate every style of artwork that other people do. It reminds me that it's often much harder than I think it is. Mm -hmm. This uh, class has been interesting for me because I am realizing more and more where all my different natural styles come from now. Like, oh yeah. I do that because I was interested in the way that this person did that. Like I had completely forgot about Jane Davies work. And for a little while I saw a lot of her videos and, you know, went to her class and stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, bigger influence than I even remember being. I sometimes think when you take something in, just like a little kid does, when you take something in really deep, don't for, you forget that you didn't know it. It's almost like it, you analyze it like you forget that you didn't know it well and you start to do um use the ideas yourself right you yeah use without prompting you own it you take it into your it becomes part of your process yep so therefore it's it is i mean although the influence is there like you know well that's for that the comment there is no new ideas right yeah. it's, it's there are circumstances of other people, or of, of other ideas. I actually find that um, weird magazines give me surprising um, inspiration, like fashion magazines, because of the color palettes they're so clearly used in all of that advertising. I'm always like, oh, I should try that. Those colors together, that thing. And that's helpful because that's actually kind of showing you what's in the zeitgeist at the moment. Mm -hmm. Also, guys, figure painting is tomorrow as usual. Remember that Thursday and Friday classes are at the same time, but Emma Bergman's going to be teaching gouache techniques. So, mm. 30 p.m. EST, 6 30 p.m. EST on Thursday. You'll be doing a gouache landscape with her. And then Friday morning, 8 a.m. PST, 11 a.m. EST. There will be a, um, uh, I think she's going to show people how to do a gouache owl. So. I uh, just started using gouache. It's pretty neat. It's, let, yeah. it's 
layer light colors over the top so you're not totally screwed if you go too dark. Mm -hmm. The opacity of it, you know, mm -hmm. the opacity of it is just so it plays this weird role between everything. It is, di and it's different. So yes, it has that kind of watery feel of watercolor. Mm -hmm. It's not as solid as acrylic, but you get all that lovely texture from watercolor, but you can still fiddle around with it a little bit more. Ooh, that's a nice one. Yeah. Dog, stop. Smiling with a cutie. Hey, Leah, randomly, my hat. Ah, I'm going to get it back to you. I'm going to try and come in. I have it right here. I'm coming in on oh. Sunday. This Sunday? Uh-huh. It's right here. 
here in the studio waiting for you. <laughs> you know where we found it? We found it behind one of the chairs. I'm coming in on Sunday to go to a Thorns game. Oh, oh. Nice. This. <laughs> what time? Would it be okay if I stopped in and got it from you? Absolutely. What time do you think you'd be here? I'm not really sure because we have people in town and we're all coming in together. Okay. I imagine somewhere in the afternoon-ish around two. Yep, yep, absolutely. I'll just be here. Awesome. Thank you. I have a class till about 2.30, but you know, if you can call me anytime, I'll be here. Much appreciated, friend. Absolutely. I got to remember to get photos, Leah, so that I can start telling people that I'm teaching. Whew. Can I take a couple? I took a couple. A few. Actually, give me one second. Also, I think you can pull up anything that's in the WhatsApp thread. Everybody who's in the thread. Uh, has basically already been instructed. And if you haven't, you're being instructed now that we might use your piece in social media or otherwise. Um, if you don't want that to happen, you should pull your piece off or maybe know your piece like that. But I can't imagine why none of you would want to show off this.
They're so weird looking when they come out from underneath this thing. And if the cat starts clearing its throat, I will know that I have lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, are you just using decoupage or are you using something more professional? I'm using a uh, 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 ooh -hoo stick, blue stick. Very professional. Very professional, right? It's solvent free. Um, and then um, sometimes if I if it feels like it has a little too many layers of weird textures, I'll use Mod Podge. Um, I know a lot of artists who preferred adhesive is a gel medium that's watered down a little bit so yeah i think that's what i have i have i think i have a i have all those things those three options um and i didn't know if like if you were getting serious enough to want to sell it if you would use glue sticks and this particular glue stick archival and so oh it is okay because yeah, it's 70 percent natural product so apparently like that makes a difference in how it breaks down um i rarely actually use mod pod unless i have to just because it's super wet um, it mm -hmm. but gel medium is a great option as well um i have two other quick questions for you Mm -hmm. One is, what would you recommend for magazine? Uh, because you know it wrinkles when you put. Mm -hmm. well, what do you use to glue that down so it doesn't wrinkle? I use Mod Podge for magazine. It still wrinkles though. Um, I have a brayer that's just for Mod Podge. Yeah. I got this weird Mod Podge kit once that came with my Mod Podge and it was a brayer and this thing that honestly looks very similar to my flat thing here. It just happens to say Mod Podge on it. Um, and between this flattening and the brayer, it tends to work. I also let things wrinkle. Yeah. An option though, spray adhesive might be a little lighter for you. Hmm. If you used it correctly, I feel like you'd have to be super controlled about it, meaning that you'd have to be really intelligent about how you used it. Mm -hmm. But it's so thin and lightweight, it's not likely to make the paper buckle. Mm -hmm. That's actually essentially why I came, came down to this glue stick, is that it's heavy duty enough for my thick papers and it doesn't tear up my thin papers. Mm -hmm. I used to use a lot of tissue paper. And so it was like fighting the war. 
Okay. So the real answer to that, Mark, so the sort of short answer to it is as long as it's archival. Huh? As long as it's archival, it's okay. That's right. That's what you want to work with when you're selling. It should be archival. Yeah, and I don't think it's going to come to this, but I was curious. I just did this um, collage canvasy thing just for my own space, but yeah. I did use photographs from a magazine and it made me wonder, like I know when as painters, like you're not supposed to, there's a place to go for free art, you know, like free photographs, but can you put magazine photographs that have already been published in a magazine on your art and sell your art are you supposed to oh, credit that it has to it has to qualify two things this is how i understand it i'm not a law lawyer i just want to preface that my understanding is there is an age in which the pic the magazine is old enough that the images in it become part of that free they have a term for it public domain free domain right Public domain. Public domain. So it, it copyrights out essentially. And I want to say my understanding is it's 50 years. So anything from the 50s to the 70s at this point, you have access to. Yeah. Um, or I mean, an older than that, obviously. My other yeah. understanding is okay. if you cut individual pieces of images out and use them, say like the Daniel Krista from the Jealous Curator will cut the image of the Queen of England out of the magazine. None of the rest of the background is used and then reuse, reuse it differently. My understanding is, is that that stays within copyright law. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it has to do with like the, how the actual composition is being represented is my understanding. I, if say like, I knew an artist like this who on who, online and he would take images and Getty owns almost everything, right? Right. And you know, one of the piece and he would uh, digitally enhance it and then sell it with his name. And it was this, it was this website it was on with a bunch of artists and it was this huge argument because we were saying you can't sell that, yeah. you know, because you're taking that image from Getty and he, you know, it's one thing, you know, if you just want to take an image and but selling it's different, right? Right. Yeah. So well, it's also that law that that suit recently against the uh, Andy Warhol, uh, which has changed things a little bit, right? Um, the right. Photographs that Andy Warhol cribbed to make his work. That artist won recently some kind of suit, but either she had to be acknowledged as the person for whom the photographs were created from from, I can't remember, but it was really recent, like this year. Interesting. Yeah. So. It's interesting. I tend to try and, you know, like I used to use this is why like vintage ephemera and stuff like that when you're mm -hmm. using apps or you're using pages out of books, you have to alter them a considerable amount. Mm -hmm. um, so that you don't have copyright infringement. It's weird that we have to think about these things, right? But it's real. Yeah, but in the digital world, it makes a difference. I mean, uh, people get their art ripped off all the time. You see it, like Society6 takes a lot of stuff offline and they'll print anything, you know, they don't check. You know, I mean, it's not them doing it. It's ripping off an image and then oh i'm gonna make 10 purses out of this and you know so we have these really difficult systems right now where yeah. like a company like um urban outfitters yeah literally steals designs from people off of etsy and then resells them on the mass market exactly yeah it's a huge problem and in china people are duplicating people's entire etsy shops mm -hmm. and cheap knockoffs yeah um I knew a woman who, um, or I have a friend who's a watercolor painter, very successful on Etsy. And one of his friends would would print out and color his watercolors, put two yeah. strokes on of her own, and resell them on her own Etsy shop. Yeah. And he was like, finally, he was like, "Why are you fucking doing that?" 
And she was like, what? What's your problem? Like, she didn't even, like, get it. She was like, my problem is, is that that's my artwork and you're clearly stealing it, jerk. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the guy who did the photograph of Obama that the other yeah. artist took and made the hope poster, yeah. he first, he denied that it was that guy's photograph. For yeah. It. And then there was finally a lawsuit and they proved it wasn't. He took that guy's photo, yeah. Yeah, totally <laughs> stole it. Of course, he thought he was just making some little thing. You know, he didn't yeah. know it turned into be such a huge thing, but yeah, but still. The minute he was found out, he should have admitted it. Right. I mean, I have work in my house that are uh, that I do for myself that are images that don't belong to me, but I wouldn't. But you're not selling. It, you know. Yeah. yeah. Here's an interesting, like when we talk about the ethics of art, which I think is very interesting. When yeah. they talk, I, get, I get super super interested in, but I knew an artist. I actually own one one of their pieces now, but. Somebody took a picture of a drawing that they'd done in their own home and posted it like on Facebook. Yeah. Just like a, you know, saying these or something. It was for, we were there for a party. And the artists like lost their mind. Right. They were livid at that person for sharing their drawing from their wall. Like it was clearly from their wall. It was like framed and everything on Facebook. Wow. And it's an interesting thing because I knew uh, I knew another artist, an, an abstract artist who made Pinterest take down all of the pins that included her work. Yeah, people don't like that. Yeah. So she was like, nope. That's why if you watch any home improvement shows, all they do is they take black and white photos of the family and frame those you don't and or very obscure abstract things that i'm sure have just kind of general you know one squishy thing you know right. mine, and they, they call it art but they can't do any anyone's real artwork because they get sued yeah you know like uh what was that movie they made of van gogh's paintings they made an animated film of it like I I didn't like that. I didn't go see it because I feel like it exploits his work. And I'm like, now would I like someone taking all my nudes and animating them and making a movie out of that? And I thought, I don't think I would, you know, and just because he's dead. And I mean, it's like Frida Kahlo. This is like people she would hate to yeah. see what has happened to her work. Yeah. Like the commodification and commercialization of her work mm -hmm. and her and her face and who yeah, she was. everything and i'm just like okay. what's up with that <laughs> you know it's a really hard question it's it always, is it's an interesting thing because we think about this concept a couple of concepts coming into light one of which is that you know women aren't shown in museums nearly obviously enough, we know that it's some crazy amount like 10% or 20% of women are in, in museums. And women's work isn't valued. Yeah. And repeatedly over time, some dude has stolen it. Exactly. And sold it as his own. So it's really hard with the, the Frida Kahlo thing because she's one of the only female artists that is considered a master. Mm -hmm. It's like her and like a few from the abstract expressionism era. And yet we know that literally it's just about money. It's about commercial, it's about commodification and selling shit. Horrifying. I, I often make jokes that like with my work, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time being really concerned about that, but listening to like Lisa Congdon talk on her podcast about some of the ways that her work has been stolen and resold by large companies and corporations. And then no, she's not given- No anything. attribution, nothing. Yeah. And nothing's done about it, yeah. And it's super expensive to go after- The people. patriarchy, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm getting radical over here.
Oh yeah, don't get Leslie started on the patriarchy. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't. I'm the worst. I get all. But, you know, I live it, and see it every day. I'm just like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. I mean, and I work at a college where you think people would be, you know, waking up, right? But they're not. <laughs> and I'm like, if I were a man, there was no way that you would have said that to me. And I actually said that to an administrator once, and he was like. Whoa. And I was like, whatever. I, uh, you know, we get lit up about it because like even things as simple as, you know, I like a lot of, I like to read a lot of art books and see, um, you know, the really big, thick $60, $70 books where you get to see an artist like life's work and stuff. Yeah. There's two bookstores in town. One is owned by a nice enough lady, clearly doesn't pay enough attention. She still carries like, she carried J.K. Rowling's super transphobic book. So like she doesn't pay enough attention, but she doesn't really carry a lot of art books. And then there's grandfather books, which carries a lot of art books, but it's all old white dudes. Yeah. And it's like to the point that we got a wholesale account at a publisher for our art gallery so that we could actually sell books in Astoria that were women and queer artists. And it's just like, it shouldn't have to be like that where another small business has to fill a need because you don't value women's work. It's like that whole thing with the color theory book that you just stumbled upon. That right. might be written by a woman. Like, hello? This is like color theory as we understand it in contemporary art was pioneered by this lady. Yeah. Like not, I don't know, you know, I don't know, not Rothko, not- Happens all the time. Ever, like it was her. It was so annoying. Well, and even her book is pretty radical because uh, she has a full studio and stuff. And this is, I mean, around the same time that Virginia Rolf, Rolf, Virginia Woolf wrote A Room of One's Own, you know, which is an entire essay, or it was a speech as it was, about women just needing a place to create and to make money doing it so that they could do it. Like, I can't tell you, you know what I'm addicted to right now is just reframing, framing, reframing, framing. I'm not even doing any more art. I'm just framing the same <laughs> shit. I like it. <laughs> Told you. Something, a small concrete tip can totally put, yep, yep. Yep. It's addictive. It's addictive. <laughs> so bad. Your mind is blown with how different things can look. Well, especially like when you have these big pieces. Yeah, I'm and telling like you like that. quarters of it's trash, but mm -hmm. one quarter of it's really precious. You just put on the old little, you're like, oh, a little, nothing wrong with a two by two. No, not if it's perfect, not if it's a perfect right. two by two, right? I'm telling you like that, that 16 foot painting that I cut down. I love the smaller pieces that it made so much better. Even though it was a pretty I, awesome. I had to walk out. So you were saying you had like a, is this the 32 foot installation you were saying? Yeah. And then what happened? I, when I took, the, took it home, because it's on a, a rolled piece of uh, watercolor paper, um, I took it in my studio. I'm not going to sell a 16 foot painting, right? So I, cut it down into sections, saved all the parts that I really loved and reframed them as smaller framed pieces. So it ends up being this series. Because I was just gonna say, yeah, people will do those series intentionally. You just yep. did it in one day. Yeah, it's fun. They're actually like, I reframed them for Astori Open Studios in two weeks so that I could you know, share them with people because the installation was beautiful. It was in an art gallery that is an old vintage trailer. And it was an interesting installation because 
the size, the height of the paper, I think was four feet. And it was like, a, maybe the, the actual wall itself was only seven feet or something. And we installed it along the floor. And I got a lot of questions from people about why we installed it along the floor so that it was the first four feet. And it was like visually coming into the trailer, the floor itself and the roof gave it space for it to visually be seen. It's this huge painting in this really tiny space, you know? Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. Talk about reframing something and, and you make it somewhere completely different and then you bring it to install it and it was, it was awesome. It was a really fun little weird project. Yeah, that's great. How long is the lady in, you guys have this color person in your gallery right now? Oh, she's in for the whole month. You know, she's actually a Portland artist. Isn't that cool? Oh, she is. Yeah, she's just really kind of young and new. I can't remember if I started following her. What's her name again? Jackie Wood. Jackie Wood. Her work is so beautiful. I got to tell you. Yeah. Because it's mineral paint and pan pastel layered. And so it looks like it's cold wax or encaustic and it's not, and it's not as thick as some of those, those materials would be. She did a really excellent job. It looks beautiful. And what a fun way to really try and force the walls, right? I had told Audrey I wanted to do a, like a salon hung show. And she was like, I just don't know if we could do that with the walls that we have. And this was our first attempt at even trying something like that. And now I feel fairly confident that we probably could, awesome. could really do it. Um, and by the way, for those in Portland, um, Astoria Open Studios is not this weekend, but it's the following weekend, the last weekend of July. I think it's the last weekend of July, right? Not the last weekend, but it is the, the fourth weekend. Fourth. It's the 24th and 25th. Right. So uh, I may truck over there on Saturday afternoon. If anybody wants to come with me, we could pull over. So we have a live painting performance at two o'clock on Saturday. We have a DJ and everything. That's kind of wild fun. stuff happening. So fun. Well, I would come, but I would have to bring my dog and I'm not sure I should do that yet. <laughs> well you know i just we haven't had him that long i want to wait till i i mean he does great in the car but that's what's two hours i don't know i totally get it i uh yeah. it took me a while with my dog too before i was like you know all right ladies we're close to the end okay uh you all should like send in your last uh, try spend but we got Here, five let me show you a last Shuffle. Is that a butter knife, Jeannie? Pardon me? You said a plastic knife. Is that a butter yeah, knife? It's like like you get when you buy Chinese food that yeah, they shouldn't so give you good. because they shouldn't be giving away plastic utensils. But now I have a new use for it. Ah, it I makes a, good, it. a really good striping thing. I, think. I love it. Look at that texture. It is really neat. I love that freaking color too. Jesus. Great. Well, class went fast. It really did. All right, now class next. Do we know, Carissa, who's going to be the next artist yet, or shall I just check in with you? I don't know yet. Um, I'm trying to decide what route I'm going to go. I'll okay. probably have to tell you tomorrow or the next day. Leslie, nice. I really like it. Thank you. Wonderful. I really like it, too. Nice. Look at these. Oh, Carissa, that's yum. Nice. Uh, know all my most important secret no i'm kidding but it's a fun exercise that's for sure and i expect carissa will probably get a new flush of people coming in the, i mean maybe not but it's it's likely that we'll get a flush of people coming in the fall so yeah. about that we have our, the classes recorded so we can just tell people to watch them um I but, think, yeah definitely the first four right where it talks about materials and stuff 
But uh, think about that as well as you're starting to plan your trajectory is imagine picking up some more students. Yeah. I think everybody's out right now. I just noticed classes, I've been a lot of time. Oh, Jean, that's a nice one. Marcel, oh my God. Hey, Marcel, I want to tell you, I really love that kind of dirty gray that you had in some of your compositions, that kind of, kind of bluish gray is quite something. So oh, I wonder what that was. I, you know, I just repainted my exterior of my house gray and I have like all these small samples. So I'm just using them now as That's paint. awesome. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, Carissa, have a wonderful- Bye, thank you. Great class. Thank uh, you, everyone. Enjoy. Carissa, we'll be in touch. I know we got a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everybody. Great work today.